comfortable with using the mic give us the mic i hope you are are you shy with, about using the mic then we have to force you to use the mic <laughs> you are going to tell us what is uh, what is the golden rule of hedging sir so the net will be initial uh, adjusted position uh, underlying position hmm. don't try to memorize or read just give me the just tell me what you have understood in in plain say, plain english that what position must be in between uh, what position uh, what position underlying only the underlying position and the hedge position so what do we call that for come yeah total position or net position yeah okay so then you as long as you it doesn't matter whether you use the word total position or net position as long as you clarify that it is the uh, sum of the hedge position and the underlying positions okay is this clear all right yes go go ahead it must remain between zero and the amount of the initial hedge initial what position initial what position initial underlying position right because this is your underlying position these are your underlying for any particular market let's say we continue to look at the oil market okay since we have the oil chart up your oil position is 25000 okay so when we say initial underlying position the text is all in your notes you have access to the notes there's no need for you to write but you can you important for you to just understand the concept you see it's shocking that nobody uh, so many people are not able to answer this question right it's a very simple concept that the total position that you have hedge plus underlying total must not exceed the uh, exceed zero and the amount of the initial underlying position and when we say initial underlying position okay you start with 25k that initial is to be understood as the hedging period is starting and restarting every every second which means what what that means is essentially that <coughs> all that it means is suppose you start the hedging program with 25 25000 barrels then after 3 months the the sales team informs you that they have sold 10000 barrels to japan okay the contract is sealed delivery has not taken place because you remember transaction dates and settlement dates the settlement date for the contract may be 3 3 months later but the price risk on that 10000 barrels has been removed because the transaction date is over they have sealed the contract with japan the delivery will be 3 months later but the price is locked in remember like just like all these futures prices that you are seeing here these futures prices this is like for this this is for february 26 2020 but if you sell at this price if you sell gold at uh, for, for you sell the feb contract at 1481 that essentially if you imagine especially this is a forward contract because the discussion we are having is regarding selling uh 10000 barrels to japan that would be a forward contract not a futures contract because it's an otc contract right between this company magma and the japanese buying team right so if it's a forward transaction we assume that it has the same price okay the futures price so if you are selling gold let's say you are selling oil at this price the price is locked in but the settlement will happen 3 months from later from 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 the transaction date is that clear everyone remembers transaction dates and settlement dates they need not be the same yes sir yes everyone is clear you can have all kinds of different settlement dates right so you can even go in the foreign exchange forward markets you have transactions which go even like 5 uh, years 10 years you know for 10 year forward rates also you can get all right and swaps when you do swaps especially you can go up very far uh, you know long term swaps so there's no limit really on theoretically there's no limit on settlement dates on how far the settlement date can be from the transaction date this is clear so it means that the uh, when the accountants do the inventory let's say the moment you on day 0 you conclude the uh, on day 1 you conclude the contract with japan all right on day 5 let's say the accounts have to be prepared because it's a 3 month contract so the settlement date is 3 months later so the shipment has not yet occurred are you following so there will be two sets of books but the hedging team needs to prepare a different set of accounting books because the accountant will still show the inventory as 25000 because that 25000 is still lying in storage is everyone following yes, sir. the traditional accountant the ca uh, a uh, ca types they will show the accountant they will still show it because 25000 barrels is still in storage but for the hedging team now the un unhedged position has changed to uh 15000 because 10000 already has been the price risk has been removed by do doing a sale contract with japan you have removed the price risk so if you take the oil contract okay so if you are taking the feb 20 oil contract let's say you sell it for this period so you sold it at 6081 now the price is locked in on those uh, uh, 10000 barrels at 
So delivery will occur later. Is this clear to everyone? Yes. This we have discussed many times that there is such a thing. That's why we have these concepts called transaction dates and settlement dates. That the settlement date need not be the same. It could be anywhere. It could be five years out, three years out, six months out, anywhere. Depends on the deal between the parties. This is clear. Everyone is clear. Okay. All right. So that's what we are saying. So when we say, so coming back to this point of why did we have this discussion to understand the meaning of the word initial. If you go back to your notes, this is where we have this. I put everything into this. I've uh, sort of modified this a little bit from um, and the golden rule of hedging. If we can just click here and go through. Right. So project goal, everything, all this stuff we have already discussed. Uh, but we're just recapping on the golden rule of hedging. So the net of the initial underlying position by this initial, what is the meaning of the word initial? It is to be uh, understood in the context of as if you're constantly updating the balance sheet with fresh information from the sales team. If any amount has been hedged, if any amount has been sold, then it is no longer to be considered as uh, unhedged inventory. Is this clear? Everyone understands what I'm saying? Yes, I think sir. some people maybe are not able to understand, but you're not asking questions. Is everyone clear about what I'm saying? Yes, so you start out by, so when you start out, the, the way the golden rule of hedging will work because of the interpretation of the word initial is, when you start out, you're dealing with 25,000 barrels or 25 contracts of unhedged inventory, okay? So I'll avoid saying a thousand every time. So you're selling, starting out with 25 contracts of unhedged inventory. After uh, say uh, two weeks, you get information from the sales team that uh, they have sold 10 barrels uh, 10 contracts to Japan right so 10,000 barrels goes off so now your fresh updated uh, underlying position will now show as only 15,000 although for the purposes of the accountant the balance is still going to show 25,000 in inventory because that is in storage but because you're the hedging team you are only concerned with market price risk and credit risk and things like that okay so therefore in this case you're mainly concerned because you can't manage the credit risk on this uh, transaction okay so you take this and you just manage the market risk on this and therefore you are going to treat this as the initial underlying position will now change from 25,000 to 15,000 is everyone clear about this this is what it means right so that you understand in your project this problem this nuance will not come into play because in your project the underlying position is never going to change okay just to keep things simple we are not going to change it but you should be aware that in real life when you are managing risk for a corporate treasury you will have underlying positions because the business keeps going on right if you're managing let's say for a gold mine if you're managing a risk for a gold mine they will keep on the stuff will keep coming into inventory the physical inventory will keep piling up but they'll also keep doing sales and when they keep doing sales you have to adjust your unhedged inventory position is everyone following what i'm saying yes right so you have to understand this nuance in, in your project you will not face this problem because i will not change the underlying positions but in real life you have to be aware that this is what the initial uh, underlying position means you have to continuously update the balance sheet with fresh information on what amount has been sold if it's been sold then the price risk has been removed because now you only have credit risk if japan does not honor its contract then uh, only then you have a problem okay but in this case you can't manage the credit risk it's to be managed between the sales team and the sovereign uh, you know uh, japan uh, so japan as the sovereign okay so is everyone clear about this the golden rule of hedging yes sir. some of you were not clear okay so so always mention this amount that understand this so there are key some key concepts how to study the concepts i'll just give you an idea about how to study the concepts right so here you see the yeah this is why Mehak was getting so this is one of the reasons why i took out your notes in the first class in the first course because i noticed that even the more serious students are just mechanically mugging up the notes and they're not able to internalize the concept the concept is not clear from the way you answer i can figure out whether the person has understood the concept or not i was able to sense that people are actually just mechanically <coughs> memorizing the text and just blurting it out okay but essentially what what we need you to do is uh, you need to understand it yourself okay whether you think in hindi or you think in some other language but you you make sure that you understand in your own head and then you express it and your english we're not penalizing you for wrong grammar or something like that right you have to be able to convey the idea that uh, the idea that you have understood so the basic idea is that you have this concept of a total position or net position okay uh, which is the underlying position plus the hedge position and the total is what you monitor all the time and you monitor it against the initial underlying position and zero so you have these two bounds 
okay you can't go below zero and you can't go above the initial underlying position and the idea that the initial underlying position has to be adjusted by uh, it has to be updated with any information which uh, gives you uh, which, which sheds fresh light on what is the total amount of the underlying position like a sales team telling you that some amount of one has been sold that means you need to update these figures on the unhedged inventory is this clear everyone is clear okay so that's what we were discussing so I put some of these things in your uh, this is also in your calc file you can see the topics that are being covered so hedging logic we have already covered this is already in your notes I'll just quickly run through it so I put everything uh, so you'll find it separately also in um, yeah so your project goal uh, that we have already discussed I'm not going to repeat that okay essentially you have to maximize your hedge PNL by uh, taking views on the markets because the underlying position PNL you can't do anything about it's going to just change uh, based on market price movements but you have to manage your hedge PNL in such a way that you can offset the losses so your total PNL will be uh, maximized all right so the procedure basically all this stuff is already written here okay we already know I've given you the example for the long side you can change it around for the short side I'm not giving both the examples all right all this stuff we have already discussed static dynamic hedging programs everything we have discussed okay so now we'll just briefly discuss is this what I have here yeah hedging for speculators now we're gonna go and so is everyone clear so far any questions okay so now hedging for speculators we are just trying to understand this so the point is that this framework that you have understood now this concept of underlying position plus hedge position you have these two okay underlying position and hedge position these two positions right and they off the idea that the hedge position offsets the underlying position is this clear so this is the central idea of hedging and the reason you can't go beyond these limits of zero and the initial underlying position is because the objective of hedging is to reduce risk okay if you go if you have a very bearish view on crude oil let's say if you have you have a long underlying position in crude oil but you have a very bearish view and your long position is only 25,000 barrels you can't sell like 70 contracts here you can only sell a maximum of 25 contracts because if you sell 70 contracts then you'll go net short that means you have again increased your risk okay so the objective of hedging is to reduce risk okay that's why the static hedging program is a more classical form of hedging in the sense it is very clearly always reducing risk is this clear whenever you're running a static program means the risk is always being reduced it is never either it stays the same or it reduces it never increases whereas in a dynamic program you can initially that's why I said the hedging the hedger is one whose first transaction in a financial market will reduce risk that is to take care of the dynamic programs because in a dynamic program the second transaction may not increase may not reduce risk it may again increase risk right relative to the way it was is everyone clear okay so the more classical way to think about hedging is to think about a static hedging program so that is why I've tried to teach you by and large with the example of a static program but then in your project I'm giving you the freedom to apply a dynamic hedging strategy if you want to okay so so what we were saying is and that is because you have to understand so that two things you have to understand that the objective of hedging is also to reduce risk because many many real life cases of uh, disasters in the corporate world because these simple principles were not being followed because people are not disciplined that's the problem most of the problems in life happen because of lack of discipline whether it's in your in your behavior inside the class in the corporate world people lose sight of what the guiding principles are essentially that's just nothing but like discipline follow you should know what you what do you have to do and people lose sight of it because they get confused and there's some real disaster I told you about the JP Morgan case 6.2 billion or something they lost on you can read it up the London whale case all right I'll, I'll just uh, put that note in your um, okay risk management disaster okay I'll also tell you about this YouTube link okay which I there's another market uh, uh, very famous fund manager very very successful fund manager you can listen to his talks on um, uh, so I've given you the video I just explained this so JP Morgan London whale you can read up on this I'll try to actually uh, uh, risk management disaster there are many such disasters in fact if you read uh, I would suggest you read the end of your Hull book your Hull te textbook at the end has I think a little bit of uh, there's one chapter you'll figure it out I don't remember the exact name of the chap number uh, title of the chapter but towards the end there's a chapter which essentially deals with risk management disasters 
okay so it, it lists out gives you a lot of little caselets on what actual disasters happened because people were not able to manage risk properly so i would do that as a reading okay so please take that as a reading whale risk management disaster plus so i'm giving you this as an official reading hull um uh, bookends uh, Bookend actually has a different meaning, but I'm just using it in a loose way. Um, again, risk management disasters. Please read this chapter, okay? This is just general reading, just to get yourself familiar because you need to know about all these uh, histories, okay? Is this clear? If you have a problem finding this, please let me know, then I'll, I'll explain that to you. Okay, next one is basically this uh, very famous investor called Stan Druckelmiller. There's a long interview, okay? So I'm just giving you this name so you can look out for it. Somehow it's not loading. So the name is uh, Stan Druckenmiller, very, very famous um, investor, global macro, also an equity trader. He's now again, here's another example. I keep telling you about how, why it's so difficult to have a, a, a standard predictive model which will help you like, throughout the years. Because unlike say hard sciences, like once we have cracked the science of flight, now we don't reinvent the wheel, okay? Because we just follow those principles and the plane will always fly, right? So there's a big difference between hard science and finance and economics. So even see Druckenmiller Miller is a very, very famous investor, one of the most successful investors of all time. But about three, four years, I think, uh, back, he started to lose money. And then now he's gone to a situation which has happened to many famous traders. They have returned all OPM. What is OPM? Other people's money. They're, they're all billionaires, so they have enough money of their own. They've returned all Soros, happened to Soros. This guy also traded for Soros. So these guys now, because their performance was uh, falling, okay, it was quite unimpressive, and they were losing money. Investors were pulling money out of the fund, so they basically uh, they could not handle the, uh, you know, the I guess the poor performance and the you know the lost damage to their reputation. So they started to they've returned all the OPM, and they're now managing uh, their own money as a part of a family office. You know the concept of family office. Yes. We have some of that in India as well. So when you have a very rich family, they will actually put their assets and they'll put in a small team to manage their assets. Okay, that's called a family office. You have that in India also. All right. So, um, so that's the idea. So now Druckenmiller Miller has also set up a family office kind of structure, just like Soros. So this is the problem that you see when you look at the great investors. Many of them uh, have uh, hit hard times, and then have, they've been forced to return OPM and just manage their own money. All right. So this is the problem. This you see. This is why I say that markets are very, very hard to predict. That's why risk management becomes the most important goal. So you play very good defense. And then if you get some opportunities, you make some money. It's a very conservative approach, but it will um, sort of keep you alive. All right. So that's another point. So there's another read, another person that you can read up or, or you look for interviews on YouTube and all. You learn a lot about how to analyze the economy, especially macroeconomic analysis, even sectoral analysis on uh, equities and things like that. Okay. So we can close this now. Right. Okay. I've given you that link. Now we go back to what we are supposed to discuss. <laughs> What is our next topic? Next topic, hedging. Okay, hedging for speculators. Now, so what I was saying is that uh, this concept of hedging, okay, so what is the basic concept of hedging is that you always start with some kind of underlying position. Okay, so the concept of hedging, only, hedging is another word that is used, you'll notice, and a lot of people use it very casually. Okay, they don't really understand it. So hedging means, but the classical understanding of hedging will be that there's always going to be an underlying position which you, for whatever reason, you can't touch. Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. That's always going to be the setting. That's the only time that the concept of hedging comes in because you can't touch the underlying position. So you have to set up a parallel position which will try to offset, but you're not able to you're not able to touch the underlying position, but you are concerned that uh, there will be some losses on the underlying position. Okay, that is typically the framework of all hedging situations. And that's why because you can't touch the underlying position, what you do is you set up a parallel hedge position which will behave in such a way that when the underlying position loses money the hedge position will make money this is clear this is the basic idea behind hedging okay so the problem and this question of hedging only arises when for some reason or the other you're not able to touch the underlying position all right so like here you have a situation where you have this balance sheet you're running a mining exploration company you can't just force your sales team and quickly make these sales so that we don't have risk on the book they can't operate like that they have a normal selling cycle so they will have to operate according to that selling cycle and that causes the company to be exposed to some risk okay and you have to manage that risk separately 
you can't put pressure on the sales team to change how the business operates you should not disturb how the business operates. that's another principle of hedging that your hedging activity should not put pressure on the business to change its manner of operation right okay so what were we saying okay so now what happens is because okay why does this always become heading now when you look at speculators now this is an example of a speculative book here's an example if you have positions in all these contracts that would be a speculative book right okay that would be if you just have these positions nothing else i started with a zero risk position and then i went and bought all these futures contracts okay so imagine that i'm not going to do any trades here but i want to keep the account clean okay so um but if i imagine that i bought a little bit of crude oil a little bit of gold a little bit of copper a little bit of euro dollars and bought some dollar yen bought some aussie okay aussie and dollar yeah, aussie and yen futures okay then you have a bunch of positions right i get 10 contracts here five contracts here seven. so then you are looking at my risk book that's an active risk book okay because i started with zero risk i didn't have any i'm a speculator i didn't have any risk to start with i had money in my account and i decided to take views on the markets and i took a whole bunch of positions is this clear right now this is now the problem here, here here the difference is that if i let's say if i have a bearish view on crude oil if i feel at this point crude oil is not i'm long crude oil and it's not going to go any higher and it's likely to drop okay the easiest thing for me if i'm a speculator the easiest thing for me to do is just to sell crude oil if i feel the market is going to i'm already long okay and i should just exit my long position if i my view has suddenly become very bearish the easiest thing for me to do is just sell it because that's a simpler situation just sell it and then wait until uh, if you are only going to go long uh, go trade from the long side then in that case uh, you can wait until it goes back down again okay and then you can buy it later or maybe you can after a while so the the, the point here is that when you're running a spe typical speculative book it's much simpler to just close the underlying position are you following what i'm saying because typically these books are these speculative books are always in the form of financial market contracts when you speculate what were you doing in your first project nse uh, stocks okay so you don't actually go and you the easiest way if you have a bearish view is when you're already long the easiest way is to just sell it right just two clicks you can just sell it it's much simpler then you're back to a square position right so therefore generally speculators if if you are uh, a, a general type of speculator okay uh, in the in the class in what we would call later on alternative asset management the general framework of selling of speculating you don't normally worry about hedging because you are just going to if you have a, a different view you are just going to square the position okay if your current position and your market view are not matching you will just square the position is everyone clear that is the logical thing that's what you would have done in your project right i told you what happens when you are when you are squaring your option positions if you were long some puts okay if you are long some amazon puts and you felt that the stock price has dropped sufficiently and the eyeballs have also dropped sufficiently and now you feel that eyeballs are going to rise stock the underlying asset price is also going to rise you would have just bought back your put right that's what you, you would have done that's how you normally speculate so so in general we don't have a requirement for hedging as a speculator but there are certain cases so you should be aware of how you can apply this concept of hedging to even active risk books okay so we need to be aware of that okay so here's what it is now you've already seen this situation before okay think about what we discussed when we talked about this is all in part of your risk management node i put everything together okay that remember we discussed this point about directional moves in the underlying and the vix okay right so this was also one of the questions very few people were able to answer it satisfactorily in the exam okay on maybe not even less not even five people were able to answer it satisfactorily why does this happen okay so we said that there's a general tendency which you see you know uh, they try to show you this thing here in this uh sibo uh, page right that when the uh, S&P goes up the VIX goes down okay so why is this happening so what the question was really on uh, the second part of the question was why does this happen what is the logic behind what is the theory behind this relationship in the first place this is not a guaranteed relationship okay and you can't also guarantee the magnitude of the relationship it keeps shifting all right so but is a general tendency that people expect uh, in the markets people expect this that if the stock market is going to fall the VIX is going to rise okay the VIX is the index of eyeballs right 
okay so if that is the case why does it happen now i've given you the reasoning here once again all right so why does this happen because now now this is where you understand the concept of hedging all right so if you see here traditional asset managers did i discuss with you guys that traditional asset managers are long only and they play in in stocks and bonds i think we discussed it briefly in ipm we didn't have a full discussion on tam versus am but we discussed a few points about traditional asset managers so your traditional asset managers are the mutual fund managers the bulk of the money worldwide is still being managed by these traditional asset managers so all your mutual funds hdfc mutual fund okay whatever else you know uh, any other mutual fund franklin templeton whatever to, uh, fund you're looking at whether it's a debt mutual fund or it's an equity mutual fund they are both uh, what we would call traditional asset managers most of them what are the some of the characteristics not all some of the characteristics of tam and uh, tam uh, 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 traditional asset managers we we'll just call them tam is these okay long only equities and debt only no currencies no commodities no real estate this is one of the reasons when you see if you talk to some of your colleagues who are doing some of your friends who are doing mba programs elsewhere you will find that most of the sapm texts uh, the ipm texts and all that most of the uh, finance electives tend to focus on uh, stocks and bonds okay equities and debt because that has been the traditional approach to asset management okay where it is to be long only and so most of the frameworks most of the syllabi are constructed around uh, a long only approach to stock equities and debt okay but i have taught you from a more general perspective because that is the more general perspective so you should always understand the more general perspective which is we looked at all the possibilities we looked at all the asset classes because all markets are the same okay there are many many similarities between all markets so uh, therefore we covered currencies commodities and real estate as well okay at least you understood the framework and then we have uh, we prefer to operate with the framework which does not force us to be long only the correct way to learn asset management is to go with a general framework which means you can operate in you can operate in let's put it this way there are many uh, constraints between uh, <laughs> traditional asset managers and what is happening this is not uh, okay yeah we put this all right so if we go back to this framework we can quickly understand uh what is the difference between tam but did i discuss am also with you alternative asset management i only discussed tam we didn't have that i know that i didn't do that full module because we didn't have the time but i discussed this aspect of tam right that is long only and stocks and bonds yes. right so and benchmarking also i discussed remember relative benchmarking that that is the hdfc mutual fund will be benchmarking against the bse 200 index so the bse 200 index is down 40% and the hdfc mutual fund is down 30% then they've done a great job so minus 30% i've done a great job so uh, that's the way that traditional asset management works all right and it, that's how it still continues to work so that you should i think that much we covered right these things we covered and that's where the distinction comes between if you look at how you were evaluated in your projects we looked at absolute return but risk adjusted right divided by the drawdown your total return divided by the drawdown so that's actually there you don't get any you don't get to say that well the market was down okay so therefore i lost money you don't get to say that so here you're supposed to if the market is going to go down you're supposed to go short you should be smart enough to see that the market is going down and you should be able to go short so whatever happens to the market you should be able to make money so the uh, the alternative asset management paradigm is essentially that you have to be able to make money whether the market is up or down so you don't get to benchmark against any uh, relative benchmarking system right you don't get this benchmark asset class specific benchmark okay you don't get to do this in the general framework of asset management this is the benchmark that you have okay in the traditional in tam but the more correct approach to asset management is that you you have you have the it's a much broader approach okay which means you can go into equities debt currencies commodities real estate anywhere okay uh, and so if you see this do you realize that this is a much broader approach and much more general approach 
okay so traditional asset management what does it do it operates basically it operates here right it operates can you see the debt debt row yeah. can you see the debt row yeah okay uh, here this is basically where it operates these two places okay traditional asset manager uh, tra traditional asset management operates in these two cells okay they trade in spot because they also have restrictions on using derivatives they also have some restrictions on using derivatives to speculate all right so they this is basically where traditional asset management operates most of your mutual funds they are basically operating in the spot markets okay because they are fully funded they are paying for the position very quickly within t plus two and then they are operating only in equities and bonds equities and debt should always say debt not bonds okay uh, so here i should say um, in fact i should change my uh, labeling instead of just writing bonds i should write bonds and bills okay maybe, maybe i've given a link to something so then I, in that case i don't want to disturb it but this should be read as bonds and bills because bonds are bond market instruments and bills are money market instruments so we'll discuss that classification later but the correct entry here i don't want to disturb it because this is a hyperlink all right so is everyone clear now how you understand uh, traditional asset management they operate in these two cells only yes so now uh, what i'm saying is that you're now again i'll have to deduct marks for bharat and uh, and uh, you're you're ch chatting between yourselves no, sir, we are making notes. no no you're not making notes i'm pretty sure you're not making notes <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you are not making notes. No, no, you are discussing something between yourselves. The are not notching up some high scores in this course. Okay, she will be given uh, woman of the uh, woman of the course, like man of the match. You'll be woman of the course. Okay. All right, guys. One sec. Let's get back to work. As soon as I start discussing something else everybody goes into their own discussions try to understand what what i mean by a general approach ritesh is already looking at the clock so <laughs> okay guys try to understand the concept here okay what i'm saying is that traditional asset management is a um, very restrictive approach because it operates only in these two cells okay they only go long and plus they have other restraints like long only okay they're going long only they use relative benchmarks okay so which means a man money manager can say index is down 40 percent i'm down 30 percent so i did a great job which is kind of st stupid if you think about it no investor is going to accept but do people do accept that okay <laughs> because there's a lot of money in in tam so what i'm saying is that am am is alternative asset management okay alternative asset management is a much more general framework because in that you can operate in any of these asset classes okay you can operate in any of the instruments okay are you seeing the flexibility the freedom the extra freedom you can operate in any of these because here these guys are not allowed to use these for speculating okay they are not allowed to use the TAM fellows are not allowed to use this so here you can operate across the spectrum you can go into any of the current asset classes you can go into any of the instruments and additionally you can be long or short which is what you guys have done basically in your projects if you see we have allowed you to both go long and short is this clear yes so are you able to see that the alternative asset management approach is more general you understand what is a general case and a specific special case in mathematics you didn't do general cases and special cases so suppose you have a function that uh, you have a function that can take both positive and negative values then you write another function of the similar you put a constraint on that and you say this can take only positive values so we would say the second function is a special case of the first function because that can take both types of values and this can take only positive values are you following this terminology you might have encountered in maths it's a special case of that function right are you following what i'm saying so what i'm trying to show you is that the am approach is more general and the tam approach can be seen as a special case of the am approach because here you are able to eat it's like you are able to eat any kind of food and then suddenly i put a restriction on you saying you can only eat italian food so that that's a special case of uh, a broader permit where you would have the permission to eat any kind of food 
Are you following? Yeah. So this is what we mean by a general case and a, uh, a special case. Okay. So the the AM approach is more general. Okay. You can remember it with respect to this framework that you can pretty much go anywhere in this framework. You can go to any asset class. You can go to any instrument, and you can go both long and short. Yes. Yeah. So we can yeah that's what we are saying the tam is that's actually another way of saying it right so the tam is a special case of am so you can just look at it as a subset of am or whatever okay so that's what i'm trying to say that here in ta in am you can have you have much more flexibility okay much more flexibility and you have the additional burden of now you're going to be evaluated against your absolute performance you have no excuse for saying that okay if i were crude oil trader if I've been money made by if I've been given some money to manage in the crude oil market and the crude oil prices were down, let's say in this period the crude oil prices were down sharply, you don't have any excuse to say that well the market is down so much and I'm only down a little bit less, so I did a great job. No. If you're an alternative asset manager, you have to make money in both up and down markets. Because your benchmark is always an absolute return benchmark. Is this clear? Okay, so that's why you see there are some magazines called absolute return, which are basically dealing with the alternative asset management industry. That's why they have these kind of names. So absolute return because it's not a relative return. Why absolute return? Because it's not a relative return. Yes. So here you can see these are relative benchmarks here. When you say why what is meant by relative return that is I'm managing the HDFC mutual fund and I am benchmarking against the BSE 200 index. So my performance evaluation is relative to the BSE 200 index. It's not some absolute figure. Okay, it is only relative to that. That's why if the index is down 40% and I'm down 30% I can say I did a great job. Okay, because my tracking error is actually I don't have any uh, tracking error. It's actually positive. All right. So my out I've outperformed the benchmark. That's what they say. Right. So that's what is meant by relative returns. Okay. So now what we were trying to show you is this to just to get a quick recap of this also is part of your uh, important part of your understanding. So I remember you asked some question earlier because uh, we asked in some of the earlier courses about uh, mutual funds and SIPs. Right. So one of the things you can understand about mutual funds is this is where they belong. They are a TAM approach. Okay, typically they are a TAM approach. So they believe you can see it in terms of this framework. Okay, and uh, remember that the other constraint that they have is long only, right? They are only from the long side. You did, they usually don't go short. You can see how difficult it is short in the Indian equity market. Is this font big enough right now, Puneet? Can you see? Okay, it's not big enough. Okay, because that's because I just made everything small to fit into this. I think we don't need this framework anymore, so I can increase um, this a little bit. Is it okay now? Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, what would I so remember long only so I'll explain I'll answer her question about the SIP also now first thing you have to understand about the mutual fund is that this is where it goes okay this goes here the mutual funds go here okay could be a debt mutual fund so they are TAM they are a TAM approach so that's why you have the importance here is that you have to be aware that there is a broader approach available which some of the money managers use some part of the industry uses okay most of the money in the world is still being managed under TAM but there is now, now the money under management and under AM is also growing okay so uh, this is what you have to understand that there is another approach possible okay which is the AM approach which is much broader now what is an SIP essentially that is just it's like imagine that this if we have this as a uh, so remember these guys have to be long only right so if we just call this the nifty let's say right right so now mutual fund you have understood now SIP is what is the full form of that systematic yeah systematic investment plan so what these guys want to do is basically they want to get you into this framework so you have to also understand that if you're investing in mutual funds that means you're endorsing this kind of framework you are endorsing it's like saying that I'm happy with eating only Italian food I don't want to eat all have the flexibility of eating all kinds of food and I only want to be long on the long side all these philosophical uh, features the, the features of TAM if you invest in a mutual fund that means you are giving a thumbs up to all these conditions that I want to be long only I want to be in equities and debt only I want to be evaluated I want my money manager to be evaluated against the performance of the benchmark the stock index 
Yes, that means are you are you following what I'm saying? If you invest in a mutual fund, you should be clear about because I don't think people think about all these things. Okay, that essentially what you're doing is if you're investing in a mutual fund, you are endorsing their investment philosophy, right? You are giving a thumbs up to all these approach, uh, all these uh, conditions that long only uh, benchmark evaluation against the relative benchmark. I mean the index benchmark, right? Another index you can use is if you're managing a mutual fund in India, you can use the Nifty 50 also as a benchmark. All right. So performance value. So if the Nifty, Nifty is down for whatever reason, then you can't tell your money manager, well, you didn't perform, you didn't make a produce a return because he's going to turn around and say, well, the index is also down. Right. So that means when you put in put money into a mutual fund, you are endorsing all these uh, you know, con uh, philosophical elements of traditional asset management. This is clear. Okay. So here's where the SIP comes in. So one of the elements of the uh, TAM philosophy is long only. Right. So what they want you to do is they remember that's why they don't say systematic disinvestment plan. So they want to get this is a way for mutual fund managers to build assets. Okay. They want to what do mutual funds want uh, managers want to do? They want to build assets. Right. Because another notice, I think what I'll do is I'll put this other thing also. Since we are having this discussion, we are just going to at this stage uh, we will just um I'll just pc is very slow actually maybe because i'm consuming too much memory all right okay what is it that we are looking at tam versus am All right, let's look at this. So, how do these guys get paid? How do mutual fund managers, how do TAM uh, people get paid? Compensation. No, commission is for brokers. We are talking about asset managers. So, the HCFC mutual fund or Franklin Templeton mutual fund or uh, Fidelity mutual fund, the manager is not going to, the fund is not going to be paid on commissions. The commissions are for the broker. Okay. The commissions are for the broker. Is everyone clear? Yes. The commissions are for the broker who sells you the fund. The fund manager, I'm talking about the compensation of the fund manager. Okay. How are they getting paid? Here. So I will put this uh, framework also so that we can cover quickly all the elements so you can understand there are many distinctions between TAM and AM. We will cover at least some of them. Okay. Uh, so let me then put this. Uh, so what I'll do is we have covered this part. We have covered this part. We have covered this part. Okay. Then we have covered the benchmark part also. Right. Then the other part is leverage will come to that but that essentially this is that you can't use any leverage in traditional asset management That's why you see these guys are always here You see why are these guys always here? What happens in a spot transaction? You have to settle it pretty soon T plus 2 pretty much sometimes T plus 1 sometimes T plus 3 but pretty much around T plus 2 Okay, so you have to settle it very quickly, which means if I buy hundred shares of uh, Facebook I have to buy at whatever the price of Facebook is per share times 100 that amount of money I have to uh, shell out in two days I have to shell out that amount of money right and uh, take delivery of the stock right that's how it works that's why essentially the reason these guys operate in spot markets is that uh, part of the big big part of the reason is because here you don't get to use leverage so you have to quickly take delivery of the asset that you bought right and then you hold on to it right so that's why leverage is not allowed okay in in some uh, technically the broker will allow you to take a loan to fund some of that purchase amount but under the framework of uh, traditional asset management you should not be using le leverage if you're using leverage you become a hedge fund manager like an am manager you go into this other box okay yes so yeah yes may have what is the question mike mike in her case we have to force her to use the mic yes yes what happens in debt mutual fund same concept exactly the same you have to buy the bonds 
if you're managing a debt mutual fund you will have certain parameters or, but essentially you'll be operating in the bond market you may buy some bills also for short-term investment if you think the yields are good so you're buying across the entire yield curve okay what you have here I think this particular link what is this link here is this to this is just the chart of the Indian 10-year uh, bond rate but anyway the point is that the yield curve that you have okay uh, you can buy across the yield curve okay you can buy all kinds of bonds and bills but the philosophy is the same as stock mutual funds you are looking at your assets now you're looking at only within the debt asset class you're only looking here if you're managing a debt mutual fund you're only in this asset class and you can't go beyond this row and this column you can't go beyond this so you basically instead of buying stocks you buy bonds and again you take delivery very quickly within like a roughly two plus two and then you sit on the bonds and you are paid out the cash and you're not allowed to use leverage same concept exactly the same yes is this clear okay so now where does the SIP come in now here you have to understand the concept of uh, you have to understand how the business works okay which is uh, benchmarks you have already understood leverage is also clear now yes you're not allowed to use leverage because you have to fully fund the position yes. okay now look at this point compensation how do mutual fund managers get compensated <laughs> Percentage of, percentage of AUM. What is AUM? Asset, asset, asset under management. Okay, so when you assets under management. Okay, when you buy, have you heard of this concept of expense ratio? Yes. So one of the ways you rank mutual funds is uh, some of these Indian sites like Money Control and all. And even in the US, you'll get opportunities. Those, those who cover mutual funds, the sites, websites who cover mutual funds. One of the options they will give you is to rank mutual funds by expense ratio. So I'll mention this here expense ratio this is an important term so the expense ratio basically is the guy's compensation right so whatever is the fund like if you say if you have a two percent expense ratio right that means if i'm a manager charging a two percent expense <coughs> ratio right so if tarun invests money in my fund if he invests hundred dollars he's only invested actually 98 dollars because of two dollars i take <laughs> okay so if i have a two percent expense ratio means he is he gives me hundred dollars but i write it down as having invested only 98 i owe him only 98 dollars so two percent i've straight away taken off okay that's my commission okay that's a per annum commission i mean we don't call it a commission actually because the commission is something that we use for brokers remember brokers are functioning as agents okay brokers are functioning as agents whereas here if i am a money manager and tarun is investing in my fund we are both acting as principals there is no broker in between but if my fund is being sold through a say standard chartered bank then the standard chartered bank salesman will collect some commission he is functioning like a broker because he's acting as my agent he's acting as my agent and he's representing me uh, before investors like tarun is this clear to two investors like Tarun. So that commission will be paid by the uh, by you all by the no that also is paid by uh, that is also paid by him yeah. that is also paid by him that's why if you see what sebi is trying to do sebi had put some commission caps and all that see this is where the scam is this is where the scam is because the uh, the brokers have an incentive the same problem with the insurance sa sales all the ULIP plans and all that because they had very high commissions, six percent commissions and things like that so the higher the commission the greater the incentive for the say for the broker to sell the product right because the more i sell the more i earn right so uh, therefore they were th this is where you lead this uh, this leads to this problem of mis selling you heard of the problem of mis selling okay when we, we should just write this it doesn't really fit in here but i'll just write it in your notes here so that we can cover it as a separate topic this is an important regulatory topic okay um are you following the discussion so far yes sir. so everything you know like the warren buffett's um, uh, partner in money management is a guy called charlie munger okay you can read up on charlie munger has some very interesting uh, there's a famous talk that he gave at harvard on uh, you know the basic uh, psychological frailties that investors have most human beings have these psychological frailties right so uh, charlie munger says that show me the incentive and i'll show you the crime 
<laughs> okay, so all crime is because human beings, this is the only law of economics that always works, that human beings respond to incentives. Okay, wherever you can make money, that's where you'll go. So this is basically what happens. You have to understand where do all these problems of mis-selling come from? Okay, so some mis-selling. Mis-selling means essentially selling a product which is inappropriate for the investor. So you take somebody who is a very old, maybe 75 year old person and you take all his life savings and you put it into a uh, high risk uh, stock fund, like a growth stock fund. Growth stocks are more risky. So you take all his money and you put it into a growth stock fund. Okay, so mis-selling essentially is um, selling inappropriate I don't I think I'm spelling it wrong but anyway let them correct it okay selling inappropriate products that is selling a product which is inappropriate for the investor okay so here basically let's let let's clarify this investment products so who do you sell investment products to you sell it to investors right so in miss selling is a regulatory uh, major major regulatory issue in many many jurisdictions around the world so you should understand it as a as a finance professional so miss selling and this is very rampant in india we had a lot of problems with these insurance plans the ulip plans which were sold to people at the commission was so high that even after after the market has risen so much the people are still underwater the investors are still underwater because the commissions are so high right so obviously if I take straight away I take 2% off he puts in $100 and I actually take uh, invest only $98 that's that's much harder for him to make money because I already reduced 2% of his return right so therefore uh, when you have higher commissions it's harder for investors to make money so the main idea in this is that you're selling inappropriate uh, investments to investors you're taking a 75 year old man uh, retiree and you're taking all his life savings and putting it into a high risk uh, a growth equity fund which can lose money right so that will cause financial problems for the investor so there are all these suitability when you're selling the ideal regulatory guideline is that when you're selling products to investors some of you may face these problems if you go into some of you have been hired into uh, banks and you may be in a selling position okay in a situation where you have to sell products so in that case you may face this kind of problem because there's some regulatory constraints okay say he tries to cap the commissions but the problem here is basically deriving from the incentive because the salesman is making a commission so now if you see think about it now suppose i'm the salesman i've sold this inappropriate product to the high, high risk growth equity mutual fund to a 75 year old retiree right and I put all his uh, savings. I've been in, uh, induced him to sell, invest a huge amount. Okay, all his life savings. Now, after the market, uh, you know, after the investment is made, if the market drops, do I have a problem? No. I don't have any problem because I've I've taken my money and run. Right, I've collected my commission and I've run away. Right. So the problem is with the investor. He has a problem because he is losing money. Right. So this is the problem. So basically, this is the problem of the uh, the whole problem starts from this kind of incentive. It's a perverse incentive because the broker has no uh, stake in the investors uh, gains. Okay. So this is what gets corrected in uh, to some extent, not exactly uh, to some extent, but it to some extent, the idea is uh, in in uh, in am you will have to make uh, you get most of your compensation is supposed to come from a incentive fee and there are some money managers who only charge an incentive fee they don't charge a percentage of assets managed but in am you have two parts of the framework you have this percentage of assets managed you get some of that but you also make an incentive return which is 30 percent some people charge 30 percent 25 percent of the profits so in am what is going to happen is i'm going to charge a percentage of aum as well okay and then I'm also going to charge an incentive fee. So here we feel that the incentives are more properly aligned because I only make money if I'm charging. Like if you take some extreme examples like Paul Tudor Jones, another example of a trader who was very successful but had to eventually return all OPM because he's very little OPM now they're managing because the performance is not good. Okay. So, but the point is that there's an incentive fee. This uh, Tudor Investments was never charging any AUM. Any percentage AUM, they didn't have this charge. They only had the incentive fee. Okay, let me just put that in bold because that is the distinctive part of this framework. This is the distinctive part of what is happening. There's a lot of disturbance happening still. Is there some problem? Okay, there's a lot of movement happening here. I don't know why there's some movement happening here. Okay. All right.
be quiet now understand this has everyone understood the incentive fee if you understand the incentive fee is a pure example if you take the case of Tudor investments okay very historically very successful fund they never had an AUM percentage AUM based kind of uh, fee they never had a fixed fee so they only made money if the fund made money and the deal was that if the fund makes money then I so usually it is 2% uh, of assets the standard in the industry you can have variations 2% of assets under management 2% okay which is the example I gave you here same as expense ratio plus 20% of profits so if I produce 100 million of profits for you I will take 20 million now you see in this scheme at least theoretically the alignment is better the incentive alignment is better because I don't make money unless I make money for you and Tudor investments is a pure example of a, is a classic example of a uh, pure alignment of incentives because they never had a AUM percentage AUM fee okay this is called a management fee this part is called a management fee this percentage of AUM, uh, uh, AUM this is the management fee and this is the incentive fee okay so these guys never had a management fee so Tudor investments would live and die based on the performance because they wouldn't make any money unless they made money for investors this is clear okay so these are the different ways of now try to understand this whole concept of SIP and what kind of incentive problems it creates okay which is that now what is happening now you have understood the compensation system so everything as, as uh, Charlie Munger said show me the incentive and I'll show you the crime so the problems of mis-selling come from the incentive okay so why did why did I sell the inappropriate product to the retiree because I could make my commission okay and that's all I care about I'm, I'm making my commission and I'm running away right now what happens so what is this concept so it is related to the idea of SIP so one of the things you can see also is that if I'm a mutual fund manager if all I'm getting as compensation is the management fee we'll call this the management fee here it's easier to write it we'll call this the management fee okay management fee this is called the management fee so even when you go to am this part is called the management fee okay and this is the incentive fee so if all I'm getting is a management fee what is my incentive I want to maximize my AUM yes I want to maximize my AUM that's how I maximize my income because that's all I'm getting right so the SIP concept comes from there what will happen if you keep on doing an SIP if you do an SIP let's say every month you're putting in say five lakh rupees into the stock market okay what will happen your S AUM keeps on growing okay if you're the only investor and you're investing in my fund, my my fund keeps on growing I have an assured uh, you know flow of money and my AUM keeps on growing bigger and bigger right so my uh, management fee income keeps on growing bigger and bigger and the reason they come up with this so a you can see they have an incentive to increase the AUM okay and the reason they want to do schemes like SIP is because see people are creatures of habit once I put you into a habit everybody's busy they're doing their own work okay if they see once they're convinced that oh I should do an SIP once you've done an SIP people don't easily take it out you know like once you're committed so you have they put you into a habit forming kind of thing right so every month some money is got you don't even have to think about it because if they left it to you maybe every month some maybe next month you're busy you just some extra pressure at work you forget to do your investment in the stock market right are you following so therefore the flow of money may not be that regular so the idea is to sell this to investors as a SIP kind of scheme so that you put them into a uh, pattern okay we put them into a pattern and then like I for instance every time I'm uh, renewing my uh, geofi okay even though I hardly use it because I'm using the uh, the fee here the network here okay but the point is that once I've locked into it I'm, I mean it's not a very good example but the point is that once I'm locked into it I'm not going to easily uh, you know uh, get out of it because I have let's say I have three four bank accounts which I'm not really using but who's going to go and then I have to taking out the bank account is a headache all this so, so if you have to take out an SIP and cancel an SIP there's also an administrative step like just like your phone many people are not satisfied with their telcos but even to do a you know portable uh, mo mobile number portability even to do that is a head headache yeah. so, so many people are just sticking with their telco because they can't afford I mean they don't want to take the headache of shifting right same with banks many banks offer very bad service but shifting a bank account is also a headache so once they put you into the SIP framework then the money flow is assured 
and it's very unlikely that people who get into an SIP will get out. Some will get out, but a big chunk will stay in just because people are creatures of habit. Are you following the scheme? Yes, sir. So this is basically a scheme where uh, which ensures that the money keeps flowing into the uh, mutual funds. Okay, the traditional asset managers. Is this clear now? Now you understood the SIP scheme. So you may be in a situation where you're selling SIPs, but I have taught you from the point of view of the consumer or the investor that when somebody tries to sell you an SIP, you should understand all that it means. It means that you're going to kind of lock into a kind of a program. You should also see how easily you can get out. You should see the terms of the contract because most people don't do that, right? They may tell you that there may be a con condition in there. I have not seen any of the contracts, but there may be a condition saying that you can't get out before three months, no, without three months notice or something. So you have to read all the fine print. Okay, when you, when you are you following what I'm saying? Yes, sir. If I lock you into an SIP and then the condition says you can't get out before three, six months, so minimum you have to invest this much amount. You, you better read the contract. So this is the scheme. All right, so we'll just move on. Is this point clear now? Yes, sir. We'll just move on quickly. All right, so make sure that you uh, understand. So, the, so mis selling is in this context. All right, okay, so we have also covered in the course of this, we have also covered um, these points. So, please make sure I'll put this into your framework. Okay, this, these distinctions, some we have already covered leverage, benchmarking, and um, compensation. What is the method of compensation? So, these are parts of your. Um, I'll, I'll wipe this out because we have not discussed this point with you all right so this is what you remember that you can when you study this table okay these are the things that we have uh, discussed with you all right okay so uh, let's go back to this uh, the point I was saying the uh, mentioning about what is hedging for we only got here because of this need for hedging for uh, speculators all right so it's a long discussion but hopefully all of the things that we discussed are useful items for you to know okay so now if you're long only if you're long only then what happens is yeah so now think of a TAM manager a TAM manager is a long only manager he's being evaluated against the he's being evaluated against the uh, index all right so the index is going up he may have a slightly negative view okay on the market but he's also worried about uh, you know he doesn't want to surrender his long position in case the market shoots up so because see understand remember hedging works in what kind of situation when for whatever reason you don't want to touch the underlying position are you following right for whatever reason you don't want to touch the underlying position only then the question only then does the question of hedging arise yes that's what we discussed so now think of a traditional asset manager who's sort of locked into a long only investment paradigm okay he's also in a kind of situation where he doesn't really want to get rid of his long position even if he has a slightly bearish view on the market he doesn't want to be uh, he doesn't want to leave his long position he don't want to sell his long position is this clear are you following the situation okay so this is what they do what is the problem sg1 what are you doing we have to also isolate you somewhere don't don't move you are also becoming like Garvit, always moving and always uh, dis doing things to distract people okay okay right now let's get back to this so so are you following here so that the 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 long discussion that brings you around to this idea that the uh, the because the need of hedging the question of hedging only arises when for some reason you don't want to touch the underlying position so the traditional long only manager is also in that type of situation because he's always long right he wants to be measured again he's measured against the benchmark if he surrenders his long position and the stock market shoots up then he will have a problem because the benchmark has gone up and his position is zero are you following the logic yes. so because of the investment philosophy and in tam the long only asset manager is also in a kind of a situation where he doesn't want to touch the underlying position is this point clear now to everyone yes. okay so that's why what he would do is when he is uh, when he is uh, bearish okay so when these guys are bearish okay so here what i've written down all the logic is written down here for you okay because they are ba evaluated based on relative returns they have long only uh, a long only approach okay so uh, they are biased towards holding large long asset positions even if they're worried about downside risk for the market right the stock market is an example okay this is what i've just told you right so this is a 
what I just discussed with you, this is already written over here. Okay, that this basically creates a hedging kind of situation. So now what do they do? Is everyone following so far? So now if you are a long only asset manager and you're worried that the market might drop, but you're also not comfortable about like letting go of your long position. What you do is now you treat your original long position as an underlying position and you buy a hedge. You, you put up a hedge position, right? Is this clear? So you buy. So now you decide to put on a hedge position and you buy puts as head as a as a hedge. Right. Insurance as a hedge position. Insurance, you understand? A put is basically an insurance. When your uh, option contracts are insurance contracts, it's just like insurance contracts. Right. So uh, you're worried about the market dropping. So you buy a put and the put serves as insurance because if the market drops, the put will make money. Is everyone following the logic? Okay. So when long only asset managers is a fairly common strategy. It's a very fair one happened now. I'll have to deduct marks for uh, Parul. She's also moving around too much and talking. Sir, you allowed Shubham to move. Now, I'm first one, you're deducting my marks. Okay, I'll deduct Shubham's mark. Also. <laughs> no, no, I've been watching you one minute, one minute. I've been watching you, you're moving around too much. No, 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 but you're talking also. You're talking to him also. You're talking to him or uh, you're motioning to him. You are too active, yeah. One minute, one minute. <laughs> Yeah, for arguing you will to lose more marks. Okay, all right. No movement, nothing. You have to sit like a horse. One minute. No argument. No argument. You are, you know you are guilty. Don't worry. Okay, don't argue. No, no, you are guilty. Don't worry. Okay, you are guilty. You are guilty. Don't worry. You have been talking too much. Uh, you have been communicating with this other seg segment of the class. Okay. So they are buying puts as insurance. Is this clear? Puts as insurance when you are long assets and you are buying a put because you are afraid that the market might drop, but at the same time you don't want to give up your long asset position. Okay, therefore you buy a put as insurance. So why do we have this? Is just to explain the inverse relationship between because many of you got it wrong. Inverse relationship between the VIX and the S&P 500. Because what do they do when they are afraid that the market will drop? They um, they buy puts as insurance. So this is the logic. These are the logical steps. They start buying puts for insurance, okay, as a hedge. The excess demand, this creates excess demand for puts, right? This push, pushes up the prices of puts. This, because of put call parity, puts and calls have to remain in line with each other. Price, there's a relationship. It's a, that's actually a case of pure AFV. Okay, puts and call prices cannot go out of line by they are ruled by this relationship between called put call parity, right? So by put call parity, if put prices are going up, call prices must also go up. Yes. Okay. So if both puts and calls are going up in price, rising option prices means rising eyeballs. Yes. Everyone follows the logic. So this is the logic that should have been given in the answer. Okay. Some of you have given it, but I think not even five people were able to explain it clearly. So this is the logic that explains why we generally expect this uh, inverse relationship between the S&P 500 and the VIX. Okay. And this, the reason I brought up this uh, this discussion again, once again, is to also understand that what you have learned as hedging for a passive risk book. All the hedging framework that you discussed uh, in the con the entire hedging framework that you discussed with respect to a passive risk book is equally applicable to an active risk book in certain cases of active asset uh, of um, traditional asset managers. Are you following the logic? So the point I'm trying to say is that even in a situation in TAM where you have a money manager managing based on uh, you know a long only approach, okay and he's evaluated against the benchmark that essentially puts him in a situation where he can't touch the underlying position or he doesn't want to touch the underlying position. So he also operates a hedge position. He also runs a hedge uh, kind of program because he also puts on a hedge. He doesn't touch the underlying position because as I said, the common sense approach, if you were running a, if you were running a, a, a AM portfolio, so AM is loosely referred to as hedge funds. Okay. People use the word hedge funds loosely. <coughs> That is when they're referring to AM. I don't know if I've written it here. Okay, I'll just put it here. Loosely people use the word hedge funds. This is one of those buzzwords, right? Now you see a lot of buzzwords in finance, which people are using buzzwords. Uh, I don't blame young people. They get easily <coughs> swayed by buzzwords. But 
you should be wary of using buzzwords. So hedge funds is another buzzword. Buzzword. Many people are using hedge funds, investment banking. Many of these use buzzwords, and people don't even know what they actually mean. Okay, they just use the buzzword. Yes, sir. So hedge fund is. <laughs> yeah, we know the class is coming to an end. Okay, so the hedge funds. When people say hedge funds, what they should be referring to are alternative asset management. But the more correct term to use is AM. AM is the more correct term. Okay, so. All right, one minute, one minute. No, okay, one minute. Let's finish this. So what we have discussed is that you can apply what you can apply the concept. Of, so the entire session has gone on hedging for speculators. Yes, okay, that you can apply the same hedging framework even to certain types of active risk books, that is speculator books, where the situation is such because of the investment philosophy that they are put into a situation where they can't touch the underlying position. So again, the hedging framework comes into play. You can see that the when the market drops, the put will make money and their underlying position will lose money. So there will be an offset. Is everyone clear? Okay, one minute. Let us see what is our next topic. One minute. Time is we have few seconds left. Okay. In this time, decision problems and hedging passive risk books. Okay. So what we are going to see here in this module, I'll just give you a preview. You think about your decision. It's already in your notes. Okay. It's already in your notes. The discussion we are going to have is what is the question in this case? One minute. We have not yet finished the case. Be quiet. Question number three in the case, we are discussing this now. We are going to be discussing this. We are going to take the same decision problems which we are already familiar with from our discussion of active risk books, your option trading portfolio, stock trading portfolio, right? We are going to now see which of these, how do the solutions to these decision problems change in the case. Now we are back to magma. We are back to the magma balance sheet. Okay. Now in the case of a passive risk book, how do the solutions to these decision problems change? Do they change at all? We are going to discuss these decision problems next. This is clear. Yes. Please raise your notes. Now you are okay. You. Four. <laughs> Let's be clear about this one second. Hedging for speculators. Yeah. So under hedging for speculators, all we are saying is that we are bringing you back. That's why I said recall. We are bringing you back to this idea we have already discussed, which is the inverse relationship between the S&P and the VIX. Okay. So first, I wanted to recap the logic for this because uh, uh, many of you made mistakes in the exam, right? What is the logic that put creates this inverse relationship? which is not a guarantee but it's a general tendency okay because that's the logic here okay so I've given you the logic now what I'm saying here is that now we are taking a fresh look at the same situation we're taking a fresh look at the same situation that is the infer inverse relationship between this and this and we are saying that this essentially gives you an example of how uh, the hedging framework that we have discussed that is you have an underlying position which you can't touch and you have a hedge position okay which you try to set off as set up as an offset this framework okay this framework can apply we have discussed it only with passive risk books okay generally will always apply with passive risk books it will not apply to all kinds of active risk books because if I'm an am if I'm a hedge fund manager then I don't care about all this being long only and all that if I'm bearish I'll just sell if I'm bullish I'm buy so therefore the best way if I'm bullish if I'm already long and I'm bearish I will just sell it okay easier thing to do but if I'm a TAM uh, person, okay, if I'm a TAM, uh, let's say AM is for manager, mm. so if I'm a TAM, then I don't want to actually just surrender my long position because the stock index might move up. In that case, the stock index goes up 10% and I've got a zero position. I am in 100% cash. So this is what these guys say that we are moving to cash, which means you start out anyway with cash. Your whole balance sheet starts out, asset side is only cash, which is all the money the investors are put in and the, uh, the uh, liability side is the uh, owner's equity which is basically the uh, the actually not owner's equity, outside liabilities your liabilities to pay the investors who have invested right so now so now what happens is therefore now from there you move to a long position so your asset mix changes some of cash goes down stocks come in now if you are bearish on the stocks for some reason if you sell the stocks and go back 100% to cash and then the stock market shoots up 10% uh, then you are going to perform badly because the stock market has gone up 10% and your return is 
zero because you're 100% cash. So what we're saying is that this kind of a evaluation framework, okay, and this kind of investment philosophy, okay, they are two two are connected because the reason you have the evaluation framework is because the investment philosophy is long only, okay. So therefore, uh, this kind of a situation puts them in a, 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 a this kind of these kind of constraints put them in a situation where effectively they are operating in a in a in a context where they can't get rid of the underlying they can't touch the underlying position effectively they can't touch the underlying position so therefore again the hedging framework comes into play so you can't touch the underlying position but still you are you are very worried about the stock market falling so what you do is you put on a hedge position which in this case as we discussed long puts you can also go short futures you can do all kinds of stuff okay but we discussed the case of long puts which applies to this situation which helps you to understand this so now you get another perspective on this uh, idea so this is a very important idea that uh, the inverse relationship between the spx and vix so one is you understood the logic for that that relationship which is the logic that is given here okay here this logic and then you have understood the broader context in which uh, this kind of phenomenon develops because the tam guys uh, are reluctant to surrender, surrender their head long underlying position. Is this clear? So, the AM, uh, an AM wala point and like SIP and VIX wala that comes under uh, the question that was uh, hedging for speculators. No, no. The uh, idea of uh, SIP is not connected to this particular idea. The reason the SIP discussion came up is because I took you into this I use this up discussion to also take you into the distinction between TAM and AM. So in this spreadsheet we have discussed several points uh, which uh, relate to the uh, uh, to the distinction between the two right and then I remembered her question because she asked that question I think in the first in IPM that she asked about SIP so I thought I would discuss since we are related discuss in this point of compensation is mentioned here so I connected the SIP question to the compensation and that's why I pulled up the spreadsheet and discuss this point so this this last point about SIP is strictly speaking not related to our discussion about uh, the hedging for speculators it's a separate issue but the reason I discussed it because the spreadsheet was pulled up and I have covered these points clear okay what happened why now you're laughing at her for asking a question no she has not so let's let her ask so have I put a limit on people asking questions there's no limit so why are you discouraging her you should not be discouraged <laughs> Uh, okay, yes. Uh, I am asking that position size in US market is uh, 100 for one contract. No. It's not position size, it's contract, contract size. size, lot size. Yeah, lot in size. the stock market, the term that we use is lot size. Yeah. So it is 100, uh, 100 shares. Yeah. So no, uh, we don't say contract because the stock for, for this kind of a situation, we say lot. You can say it's not wrong to say contract because there is a contract between you and the exchange. But the term that we use is lot size. So, so why do we. That's why we have another term called odd lot. So, why do you say. Uh, that so, when you want to buy 75 shares. That will be called an odd lot order. Yeah, that will be point seven. That's why I want you to force you to use the word lot size, lot size, OTC so that then you can see. No, it's not OTC. This is an exchange traded market. Stocks are traded in exchange traded market. No, you said that uh, odd lots can be traded on OTC. Yes, odd lots can be traded on exchanges but also, but these prices don't. You'll get worse prices. Okay, you have to demand. Yeah, it's, yeah because you are going outside the convention, so you will not get this price. You may not get this price. You get it, you're lucky. You're not entitled to get this price. So in TWS, is there a provision for that also? I yeah, I'm pretty sure. I've never traded odd lots, because, but I'm pretty sure that TWS will allow you to trade odd lots also. And sir, in, uh, like we have twenty five thousand of uh, oil, crude oil. So you say always twenty five contracts. So could we do fifty contracts? What for uh, crude oil? Yeah, we have twenty five thousand in yeah. position. So there will be 250 contracts. No. Because the CME crude oil contract is thousand barrels. Okay, so this is the thing. Check the check. Let's check it. I'm pretty sure it's thousand barrels, but let's check it. Yeah. 
energy complex. You see how many different products trade there on the energy contract. See all the open interest. See how high the natural gas open interests are. Uh, figures are very high. Lots of volume. Okay. Let's look at crude oil futures. Let's go to the uh, <coughs> to the contract specs and look at it. I'm pretty sure it's a thousand. There you are. So that's why I said 25 contracts. And then uh, gold also we have 25 contracts because it's 2500. One minute. No, not here. No, the spreadsheet is here. The balance sheet is here. Gold, how many do we have? Yeah. So there's also 25 contracts. So very small balance sheet because of the constraints of the capital. So we don't have any odd contracts. No, that balance sheet don't have odd lots. In no, no. The balance sheet has been constructed in such a way that you will not have any uh, broken contract sizes. That is how I've constructed the balance sheet. <laughs> Taking into account the contract sizes. Yeah, because that can cause so that that so that if you want you can go to 100 percent hedged and the balance sheet has been kept very small because that also gives you if you go to 100 percent hedge and then you start making losses on the hedge position okay then you will have to pay for those losses there is a futures contract you're paying every day so i have deliberately kept the balance sheet because knowing that my master constraint is one million dollars in risk capital one million dollars in investable capital and risk capital so that's my master constraint so everything is structured around that and then i put additional constraints in in the form of the contract sizes so that's why i've made them round lots in terms of contracts Just clean. that's why it's like this right?